It's important when we are talking about uh, customer rights to, of course, take a look at the types of relationships that we can have with our customers. Of course, when you ask any manager, um, what do you think of your customers, they'll say, oh, they're the most important part of the business. They're, <coughs> they're critical. We do everything for them. But then in actuality, it seems that the practice of business is not to do everything for them. And that's what we're trying to correct by having an ethical perspective. So we're going to take a look at a couple of pretty famous stories to kind of illustrate these points. First of all, um, back in the 1990s, there was a story of McDonald's and their famous uh, customer, Stella, who um, went with her grandson to a McDonald's drive through and she ordered a coffee with milk and sugar. They picked it up at the drive through paid for it, went to uh, the, you know, continued into the drive, the, the parking lot, parked the car, and she put the cup of coffee between her legs, took to take off the lid so she could put in the sugar and the, and the milk and, and mix it so that she could drink the coffee. <clears throat> the lid was a bit tight and she struggled with that and in that struggle the lid popped off and the coffee spilled out over her groin area and she ended up with third degree burns they had to take her to the hospital she spent a week in the hospital and uh, they actually had to do skin grafts from the thighs of her leg into the groin area because the burns were so severe. <clears throat> now, who would think that that could happen from a cup of coffee? It's beyond comprehension, but it did. So Stella um, was in the hospital for, um, for a week. Her health plan covered 80% of the cost of the hospital stay, but there was still 20% <clears throat> of the bill, which was approximately $20,000 that Stella now had to pay for getting a cup of coffee. So she wrote McDonald's a letter and said, listen, I got coffee from you, it spilled. I ended up in the hospital because I was severely burned by your coffee. Um, my bill is $20,000. I'd like you to pay the bill. That's all she asked for, was that um, McDonald's simply cover her out-of-pocket cost for the hospital stay. McDonald's wrote back and said, we're really sorry to hear that uh, coffee burned you, but coffee's hot and it does burn people. We're very sorry that we can't cover your hospital stay, um, but we are willing to give you about $860. Stella wasn't too satisfied with that, and she called her lawyer, told her the story, and the lawyer decided to sue McDonald's for $3 million. And he calculated that charge because he was looking simply at the profits that McDonald's made, 1% rather, of the profits that McDonald's made in selling coffee. And he felt that that was a punitive enough measure, uh, um, a punitive enough expense for them to understand that they had, uh, that they had injured his, his client. So to make a long uh, story short, um, Stella won the case and the court and the jury awarded her uh, the three million dollars. Now 
uh, at the end of the day, um, McDonald's appealed, <coughs> and uh, they were allowed uh, to reduce the claim from three million to, I believe, three quarters of a million, or seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars. And that included the pain and suffering that she had to go through from the operation, and obviously uh, as well the um, the cost that she had to pay for her insurance plan. So the question is, what did McDonald's do wrong here? They make coffee, like thousands of other restaurants. And they sell their coffee, and everybody knows that coffee's hot. Everybody knows that you don't just take a cup of coffee and spill it on yourself. So what made this case something that first awarded them her three million, and then secondly, uh, we adjusted it to 750,000. And this is what her lawyer found out. First of all, normal coffee, when you buy it anywhere else, is usually about 140 degrees Fahrenheit. When you make it at home, it might be as low as 120 degrees Fahrenheit. <coughs> McDonald's coffee is 185 degrees Fahrenheit. It's so hot that it can be burn, <coughs> excuse me, it can burn the skin off your body in less than seven seconds. Now, her lawyer argued, that's not exactly a cup of coffee. A liquid that can burn the skin off your body in less than seven seconds if it makes contact with you? Uh, most people would not treat that the way they treat a cup of coffee. That was the first point. The second point was, knowing that they made the coffee that hot, McDonald's had made virtually no effort to advise its customers that there was a problem here and that they should be cautious. And in fact, it came out in the case that um, McDonald's had had 750 other complaints from people who had been burned by their coffee. And I, as someone who has had McDonald's coffee, can attest to that, that when you first open up the cup, if you're not careful with your first sip, you're going to find you burn the roof of your, uh, your mouth. So the, so the uh, question becomes, are they treating their customers ethically as a partner or as a potential victim? Now clearly McDonald's didn't care because they'd had other complaints and they never adjusted the temperature of the coffee. Why didn't they adjust the temperature of the coffee, you might wonder? Well, what they had discovered in their market research is that when people come in to buy coffee, if it tastes good, they buy the other breakfast items, like the Egg McMuffin or a turnover or whatever else they're selling. How do you get bad coffee to taste good? You heat it up. Now, they didn't buy good coffee. Had they bought good coffee, they wouldn't have had to heat it up that much. So that's the story with Stella Liebeck and, um, and McDonald's. And, and I think it highlights a, um, a, a critical example about the nature of the relationship between business and their customers. So we have three approaches that we can use that are in the literature. The first um, uh, relationship that we can use which is the one that McDonald's used, is called the contract view. <clears throat> Essentially, the buyer has to beware. As they say, caveat emptor, we make an assumption that the person who is buying the product has enough knowledge to understand how the product functions, how to use it, and how to protect themselves um, from any potential danger that might be in the product. 
So McDonald's in this case would have presumed that Stella Liebeck knew that their coffee was served at 185 degrees and that next time she would bring the jaws of life in order to handle that particular cup of coffee. The contract relationship was the dominant relationship um, in business and, and with the customer for most of the 50s and the 60s and even perhaps the early 70s. Then what happened was the consumer movement began to move forward. People like Ralph Nader um, wrote uh, his book, Unsafe at Any Speed, putting the responsibility for putting seatbelts into cars into the uh, arms of the automobile manufacturers and so a different type of relationship began to form called the do care relationship. Now that's where the seller, the manufacturer, <coughs> looks at his product or her product and he takes account and, is, and responsibility for the different ways that the product can impact their customers in a reasonable way. So when we look at the story of the seat belts in cars, um, General Motors and the other Ford would have said, well, you know, at a certain impact, our customers have the chance of being thrown out of the car if they're unsecured, resulting in either horrible injury or death. And so it becomes our responsibility to protect the customers from that occurrence. And so we will put in seat belts. Now I'm giving you, of course, the after fact, after the fact, understanding. But that's an idea um, of uh, of what we're talking about. So the manufacturer essentially assumes the responsibility for the safety of the product, and that, of course, is a tremendous respect for their customers who now seem to be an equal partner in the, um, in the relationship. Finally, because most companies, of course, have not followed that due care approach, there emerged a third nature, or a third relationship type, which was um, started in, in California. I, I don't think it's really moved out of that state. <clears throat> but it, but it, 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 it has less intense versions of it. This is called the social cost uh, relationship. And in that case, all of the dangers and the flaws of the product by law automatically defer to the seller or the manufacturer of the product, regardless of how foolish the customer is at the other end. So let's say, for example, if you had a manufacturer of a baby stroller and they're wheeling their kid and they come out from the shopping mall and they go to their car and they fold up the, sh the baby stroller with the baby inside and they harm the child, the responsibility and the damages for that fall on the manufacturer of the baby stroller and not the parent who actually folded the stroller up on the kid. Now you might think that's crazy, but that is the nature of the laws that emerged in California to compensate for the lack of any corporate involvement in creating a really positive due care approach. So to give you an example, um, I gave you the story with the stroller. You'll see on uh, hair dryers that are sold in the state of California, they have a warning inside the package that cautions people to not use the hair dryer, you know, that you blow your hair dry with, while sleeping. There are also warnings on lighters for cigarettes, cigarette lighters, that uh, let you know that they may contain flammable liquids. 
so that if by accident you caught your hand on fire, understand that's what the cigarette lighter has inside it. So this may seem a, a bit off the wall. Unfortunately, it has truth to it and, and has generated a ton of revenue for the legal industry. But it's not helpful for business because when business has to deal with that type of legislation, the cost for protecting themselves is obviously calculated and put into the product. And so you may be buying a product that is made in California or sold in California that has an additional cost attached to it, whether it's one, two, or five, or 10%, that is purely to protect the manufacturer from any potential liability that they may have regarding um, uh, somebody in California buying the product. So clearly they're dysfunctional and from an ethical perspective, they're really not nurturing a positive relationship. So the social cost is unethical because the customer drives the entire agenda and that's unfair to the manufacturer. And clearly the contract view is unfair because the manufacturer drives the agenda and that's clearly unfair to the customer. So what we would like to be able to understand is that as an ethical manager, you would understand the limits of the knowledge that your customers had, and you would develop strategies and programs to compensate for that. So for example, um, having a 1-800 line for an electronic product that people might have problems understanding how to work is a great idea. That's caring about your customer from this perspective, from a due care perspective. Having warranties for products that are allow a reasonable use time to be sure that there are no defects that are in the manufacturing process, that seems to make sense. Those are all choices that would emerge from ethical managers trying to be sure that they uh, take care of the needs of their customers. <laughs> now, you know, another famous story is Nestle Foods, who made um, baby formula that um, they did very well with in the North American uh, first world uh, and European markets. But then they felt there's this great opportunity to sell these products in the third world where there are not even close to the sanitation conditions required to have clean fresh water to mix the formula with and secondly the obvious cost of the formula was many times the income that the average family living in the third world was able to earn however in order to use formula, um, the woman had to undergo a, a surgical procedure or a procedure that stopped her natural breast milk from coming. And now all of these people in, in the third world couldn't afford the formula and they couldn't naturally feel, feed their children. And so the kids were dying. And at the end of the day, Nestle was accused of being uh, a, a murderer, a, creating a genocide amongst all of these little children that died because the parents couldn't afford the formula and they were unable to feed the children naturally. So it was a PR fiasco and a disaster for over 10 years. And it harmed the brand enormously because people said, how could a company do this knowing that they, the people couldn't afford the product and that there were, was not enough clean and safe drinking water to mix with the product even if they could afford it. So all of, of, of these stories, and there are many of them, talk about marketing and its relationship with the customer and taking advantage and exploiting vulnerable 
consumer markets, whether they're here in, in the first world, whether they're children, whether they're the elderly, or whether they're in the third world, and they're people that are ignorant about many of the health concerns that are necessary. In all of these cases, all of these unethical um, marketing approaches ultimately come back to a legal remedy which costs the company money, which reduces the share value for the shareholders, and nobody wins. Whatever gains were made in the beginning, the short-term view, are lost out in the end, the long-term view. So hopefully you can appreciate that it's important as an ethical manager to look at your customer from this do care perspective as a real and true partner in your business because they're the ones who drive the revenue. And therefore when you build the products that you build in not only safety and quality into the products for the consumer market you're going after, but that you build in the after purchase protection that customers need. And that will create a much stronger um, channel, a much stronger customer base, and ultimately um, will work for the benefit of the company.